Good evening. I'm Sister Margaret Palliser, and uh, it's now my privilege to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. Dr. Janine Hill Fletcher is a professor of theology at Fordham University, where she has taught for the past 18 years. Now she's in her 19th year, hard to believe. And uh, Professor Hill Fletcher grew up in a suburb of Chicago and attended the University of Illinois as an undergraduate, majoring in English. After a year with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, she attended Harvard Divinity School, where she earned her Master of Theological Studies and her Doctor of Theology degree. Professor Hill Fletcher's teaching lies at the intersection of systematic theology and issues of diversity religious diversity, Christian cultural diversity, race, and gender. Her research and teaching explore the role of theological thinking in shaping public discourse, including activism and legislation. She is a board member of the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, a multi-generational, multi-religious, and multi-racial grassroots organization working for social change. Professor Hill Fletcher's research has focused on how religious identity is constructed and mobilized in a pluralistic world. Her most recent book, The Sin of White Supremacy, Christianity, Racism, and Religious Diversity in America, investigates the history of theological thinking that informs legislation and envisions Christian symbolism as a resource for transformative politics and activist practice. Wouldn't we like to see transformative politics? And there's information on her book at the tables in the back if you're interested in it. All of this is to say that we are very pleased to have Janine with us this night. I'm delighted to say she will take questions following her presentation. So please help me welcome her now. I want to thank Margaret and I want to thank the sisters of Spark Hill for inviting me to share some of my work with you tonight. But I also want to thank each of you for being present for not only sharing my research but also the conversation to follow. Um, so I'm hoping that I can share some of the work I've been doing but also that we can learn together. And it, it struck me as I was seeing the video for the first time of the sisters in Pakistan um, how they might also have resources and ideas about how we might live together with religious difference, um, because I think that that is one of the things that my history uh, has shown, uh, is that we have had a difficult time living with religious difference, and we have that challenge in front of us even today. I think, I think we're good. So my discussion uh, begins with a history, a history of who we are as a nation so that we can think together about who we are right now with that history in view. And so I begin with our great seal, adopted in 1787. E pluribus unum, the great seal of the United States says, out of one, and one out of many. As you can see on the original Great Seal, designed in 1776 by a committee that included Jefferson, Franklin, and Adams, it was the vision of our nation's founders that a diversity of people would come together to create what would be the United States. The nation's shield, shown here, would show the lion representing the Dutch. You might be able to see it. I don't think I can get my pointer to work the lion representing the Dutch, the fleur-de-lis of the French, the rose of England, and so forth. This was their original sketch in 1776. That shield that brought together all those different nations and peoples would be under the watchful eye of providence. The shield would be held by the goddess of freedom and protected by the goddess of liberty. Tracing E Pluribus Unum back even further, John MacArthur proposes that the American colonists took this phrase from a popular literary magazine whose illustration showed that these differences were not to be melted together in an indistinguishable mass, but preserved as a strength, even a beauty. 
This motto, E Pluribus Unum, remains on our great seal, although the shift from the original imagery of diverse symbols coming together to form that one shield, or diverse flowers in the same bouquet, seems to be erased when now the 13 colonies are represented by the same white stars. The idea that diversity is our strength gets lost in this symbolic translation. I'd like to suggest that this erasure has also taken place in our national consciousness. The original image from a literary magazine seemed to invite Americans to meet the intellectual challenges of pluralism by considering more perspectives, not less. But the pattern throughout US history has been to diminish the original dreams of the founders in the creation of a nation that prioritized one religion and one set of people above all others. Indeed, our present moment seems to have come a very long way from the optimistic outlook that one might come from many. I'm going to suggest that the greatest intellectual and faith challenge of E Pluribus Unum today is not diversity, but the resistance to diversity in the form of an ideology of supremacy. The greatest intellectual and faith challenge to becoming one out of many continues to be an ideology of white Christian supremacy that withered the potential beauty of the bouquet with legislation that created a nation for free white persons, as was written into the legislation in 1790. The historical precedence of prioritizing the well-being of white Christians from out of the many different ways of being human has undermined our body politic and continues to corrode the roots of E Pluribus Unum. Even today, the greatest faith challenge to becoming one out of many is the temptation to ignore our history of vibrant religious diversity and racial diversity, and also to ignore the sin of white supremacy that erased this diversity, infecting our past, structuring our nation even today. An unwillingness to abide by e pluribus unum compromise the flourishing of a diversity that could be our strength. The argument I'll make in our time together this evening is that our nation's highest ideal, one out of many, was compromised by an ideology that was both religious and racial. Instead of a nation that flourished in difference, we became a nation that floundered under the sin of white supremacy. And in each era of our failings, it was Christians who failed, failed by the criteria of our own measure, that we love one another. But if we can see the roots of the problem of white supremacy in Christian failing to love, we might mobilize Christians to renew their efforts across religious and racial lines, to mobilize our Christian tradition to recreate a nation of one out of many. And this will be my proposal in the end, that the very principles of Catholic social thought might be resources for addressing our epic failures to love that Catholics and Christians might once again be guided by the prophetic vision of Jesus in the creation of a kingdom of love within our very nation. The story I will tell is the way white Christian Americans failed in their calling when they used their Christian scripture to undermine the full range of E Pluribus Unum to create instead a nation that prioritized white well-being. From out of the resources, lives, and labors of many came one white Christian nation, built on and infused with an ideology of supremacy. As I narrate this history, I ask myself, and you, what might have been different? And how do we learn from our past to create a different present toward a better future? Shortly after the founders gathered to envision a great seal of one out of many, the possibility existed that the shields of the many of European nations might have been expanded, oops, sorry, might have been expanded to include the shields of the original nations of this land. Some among our founders anticipated the possibility that the indigenous people might bring bring strengths also to this great nation, 
And when a treaty with the Delaware Indians was signed in 1778, and this is the image hard to see, of that treaty on the left here, when this treaty was signed with the, with the Delaware Indians in 1778, written into that treaty was the possibility that the Delaware nation would form a 14th state a coalition of original nations, which would have been represented in Congress. But this article of the treaty did not meet with the approbation of Congress, and indigenous peoples would be increasingly dispossessed of the possibility of contributing to e pluribus unum. In fact, leading Christians of the time, leading Christian thinkers, ministers, statesmen, saw in the diminishment of the original nations of indigenous peoples God's plan for a white Christian nation. For example, the theologically trained president of Yale University, Ezra Stiles, celebrated not the expansion of e pluribus unum, but the extinction of non-white peoples as part of God's plan. In 1783, he preached, the European population surpasses them so already that of whatever origin they will eventually be, as most of them have already become servants unto Japheth. 612,000 Indians pay tribute in Peru. We are increasing with great rapidity, and the Indians, as well as the millions Africans in, the, in America, are decreasing as rapidly. Both left to themselves in this way diminishing may gradually vanish. And thus, an unrighteous slavery may at length, in God's good providence, be abolished and cease in the land of liberty. It's important for white Christians to come to terms with our ancestors' celebration of the genocide of indigenous peoples and Africans in America as part of God's plan. Other prominent statesmen of this era and later eras used Christian scripture as a warrant for dispossessing native peoples from their land. Guided by the principle found in Genesis that God had commanded humanity to, quote, fill the earth and subdue it, Christian politicians argued that it was only the European settlers who properly fulfilled this divine directive. In 1802, President John Quincy Adams wondered, what's the right of the huntsman to the forest of a thousand miles over which he has accidentally ranged in quest of prey? Shall the fields and valleys which a beneficent God has formed to teem with the life of innumerable multitudes be condemned to everlasting barrenness? Same question was asked, same scriptural reference was used when Governor William Henry Harrison struggled to take possession of Indian lands. He asked the question this way, is one of the fairest portions of the globe to remain in a state of nature, the haunt of a few wretched savages, when it seemed destined by the creator to give support to a large population and to be the seat of civilization, of science, and of true religion. Notice how the political rhetoric uses scriptural reasoning, Christian scriptural reasoning, to propose that white Christians were more closely following God's design for humanity, erasing the relationship that the original peoples had to the earth and to the creator. By the middle of the 19th century, this religious category of Christian was seen clearly as a racial category of white people. When Senator Thomas Hart Benton answered the question of whether the U.S. should claim the Oregon Territory with reasoning quite similar to what we've seen. As he wrote, it would seem that the white race alone received the divine command to subdue and replenish the earth, end quote. This image from the era provides a visual sense of God's good providence guiding the expansion of a white Christian nation, even as it included the devastation of the original nations. All of this ideology that white Christians were in a better position to pursue God's plan was written into law in 1823, when the Supreme Court decided that European Christian nations' right of discovery superseded the original nation's right to occupancy. The indigenous people had no right to title and therefore no right to the proceeds that might come from sale of the land, and this law still on the books still impacts the rights of sovereignty for the original nations of the United States of America. 
If Christian theologians and Christian lawmakers used scriptural reasoning to justify the reduction of the creator's people from thriving nations and cultures to land reserved for them, what responsibility do Christians have today for dismantling the doctrine of discovery, which reduced indigenous peoples with religious, political, and legal arguments that still impact their lives? Bringing the national story down to our local level, what relationship and responsibility do Christians have to the indigenous people who originally inhabited our land? If the Lene Lenape people were part of that original Delaware Confederation, and if that confederation had had, had its represent, representation in Congress, how might our landscape of E Pluribus Unum be different? If we're to become one out of many, Christians must also come to terms with the way our scriptures were used for the devastation of African peoples. Here again, things could have been otherwise. Some Christians saw clearly that the call of the gospel required human freedom and the denouncement of slavery. For example, in 1693, George Keith implored his Quaker sisters and brothers, and I quote, not to buy any Negroes unless it were on purpose to set them free. The publication of The Selling of Joseph by Samuel Sewall in 1700 also demonstrates that there were reasoned arguments against slavery rooted in the Christian faith. Some Christian leaders were following this sort of reasoning, the reasoning that said that God's plan for the sons of Adam included the African peoples. But in Seawall's writings, we see the counter-argument that runs all the way through this period. The counter-argument that the African peoples, because of their paganism, deserved God's curse that was first pronounced on, on the son of Ham. So this curse of Ham that Seawall reflects here is a set of scriptural reasoning that goes back to the story in Genesis of Noah and his son. And this curse was used throughout this era of Christian history in the United States, used by not only politicians but theologians as well to reason that slavery was also part of God's plan. For nearly 200 and uh, sorry, this was, this is the, so the, the same Christians, right, this was their logic, that, that God's plan included the settlement of uh, the, the nation, settlement of this land, that God's plan included, right, their rights within this nation, their rights to import other human beings. So this is from the Constitution. For nearly 250 years, white Christians reasoned with their scriptures that God had ordained the servitude of slavery for their African sisters and brothers. In this tragic era of Christian history, it was white Christians who stole human beings from their homes, shipped them as cargo, and condemned them to perpetual servitude. Christian thinkers used the curse of Ham to justify that the peoples of Africa were Noah's cursed descendants, destined by God to be enslaved. In the words of John Henry Hopkins, the first Episcopal Bishop of Vermont, and I quote, the heartless irreverence with Cham, the father of Canaan, displayed toward his imminent parent, that is Noah, whose piety had just saved him from the deluge, presented the immediate occasion for this remarkable prophecy. But the actual fulfillment was reserved for his posterity after they had lost the knowledge of God and become utterly polluted by the abominations of heathen idolatry. The Almighty, foreseeing the total degradation of the race, ordained them to servitude or slavery under the descendants of Shem and Japheth, doubtless because he judged it to be their fittest condition. And all history proves how accurately this prediction has been accomplished, even to the present day." End quote. 
I wanted to include this contemporary rendering of Bishop John Henry Hopkins, which I found online being sold in celebration of what he had done as the first Episcopal Bishop of Vermont. And having read all of this work that he had done in promoting the idea that slavery was part of God's plan, it, it struck me as, as, as um, it, I had an affective response to seeing the nimbus or the halo around his head. And yet that's how the history is told in ecclesial history, right? Upheld the figures who established uh, the church in the various parts of this nation and erasing some of the very difficult elements um, uh, by which those churches were established, including uh, their, their involvement with slavery. Prominent theologians and church leaders, even in the Catholic tradition, created the symbolic and theological sanctioning of slavery. The Archbishop John Hughes published an article that followed many of the reasonings that John Henry Hopkins collected in his pamphlet in a, in a biblical defense of slavery. Hughes says that Abraham possessed slaves. We can read that in the scripture. He says the divine savior did not teach or prescribe any law in reference to that topic. And so Jesus didn't have anything to say about slavery. Archbishop Hughes also argued that the Christians, sorry, that the enslaved Africans were better off in the conditions of servitude in America than they would have been in, the free, in freedom on the African continent. Right? He says, uh, I've quoted in the beginning there, where slaves have been introduced to a country, the church does not require of her members that they shall be restored to their primitive condition, which would be oftentimes worse than the ones in which they are placed. This sense that somehow becoming Christian under the conditions of slavery was preferable is part of the logic that Archbishop Hughes used. It's stated directly by the Catholic Bishop um, of Louisiana at this time, where he reasoned that slavery was an eminently Christian work in which the redemption of billions of human beings who would pass in such a way from the darkest intellectual night to the sweet light of the gospel. One of the things that I don't think we have studied enough in this period is not only the theological reasoning, but it was a theological reasoning of Christian versus non-Christian. There's elements of legislation in the early part of this country that identifies that if a servant had come from, an indentured servant had come from a Christian country, they would be in the condition of servanthood. If a Christian had come, uh, sorry, if a, if a servant or an indentured servant had come from a non-Christian country, it was written into the legislation that they would be identified as slaves for life. Right? And so the difference between Christian and non-Christian then had legal ramifications in this economy of enslavement. It's important not only to see and take responsibility for the theological reasoning that's part of our heritage and that, and that wrecked this devastation on the peoples of Africa. It's also important to see that slavery was a financial crime where unpaid labor of millions of, slaved, of enslaved Africans built up the economic security of white Americans and white institutions. The lifeblood and livelihood of countless enslaved persons was converted to economic resources for the well-being of white owners and white institutions, white wealth and white institutions that continue today. If white Christians were responsible for the financial crime of slavery, which stole the labor and lives of 12.5 million human beings, what work must white Christians do to repair the debt of illicit gain through stolen means? What work does our church need to do? What work do our institutions need to do to address the buildup of white wealth through stolen lives and stolen labors of African Americans in our histories? These lives and labors form the foundation of our institutions that exist even today.
How might it have been different if Christians heard the call of the gospel to love one another? This call was put out. Christians chose not to hear it. It was put out by some white Christians, but also by the African Americans who were converted to Christianity and who saw clearly the absolute contrast between the call of the gospel and slaveholding Christianity. If you have a chance to reread Frederick Douglass's piece, he says, that's not Christianity. I know Christianity. I know the call of the gospel. And, and slaveholding Christianity, which is what the Christianity of this country was, was not gospel Christianity. But how might we still hear their call in the practice of reparation today that we might authentically become one out of many? White Christians not only use their scriptures to justify extinction and enslavement, they also used it to justify the extraction of labor from people of color while denying them full benefits of citizenship. And so my next chapter is the 19th century where e pluribus unum is restricted through the legislation of immigration and yet the, the resources for the nation are extracted from out of the many. As we move into the 19th century, we have to envision the nation expanding with land recently taken from Mexico and the blessings of land ownership and education being delivered to American, American citizens. But since the restriction of citizenship to free white persons was still on the books, the blessings taken from this newly acquired land would be given exclusively to white Americans through legislation like the Homestead Act that provided land for any citizen who would claim it and the establishment of our land-grant universities, which used the proceeds from the sale of Indian lands to create public higher education. At the same time, in order to build up this land, the nation needed the help of people from other lands, from other nations, and a wave of immigration arrived in this country, which included Asian workers who came to help, who were specifically recruited to help build the nation in the West. Wealthy industrialists found ways to expand a capitalist economy, and as they did, new immigrants competed for entry-level jobs with the lowest wages. Racial stereotyping kept wages low, as for example, the president of the Central Pacific Railroad described the Chinese workers in this way. As a class, they're quiet, peaceable, patient, industrious, and economical ready and apt to learn all the different kinds of work required in railroad building. They soon become as efficient as white laborers. More prudent, more prudent and economical, they are contented with less wages. In addition to exploiting Chinese workers for their perceived contentment with less wages, American Christians aim to help support the Chinese by facilitating their conversion to Christianity, which would make them appear to be better suited to the American Republic. These focused efforts at Christianization paralleled the debate over whether e pluribus unum had room for the Chinese. And it was Christian leaders who debated this issue in public. For example, in the widely publicized and later published debate between Father James Bouchard and Reverend Otis Gibson, while Bouchard, a Jesuit, argued that the Chinese had insufficient morals to become part of the United States, contrasting them with Irish Catholics, Gibson defended the Chinese and encouraged with these words. This is Gibson. All invidious legislation should be repealed, and Christian men and women must multiply their efforts to uplift and Christianize these people. The reasoning about the necessity to Christianize the Chinese workers even found its way to the halls of Congress, and this particular form of scriptural reasoning that the senator from California, A.A. A. Sargent, offered to his constituents. He said, the command of scripture is this, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Not overwhelm your own family, your own neighborhood, your own nation with the bigots and effects of heathenism. Let the missionary go to China and convert these men from their heathenist practices, wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the lamb. And then being fit for citizenship to, and to become an integral part of our society, then let them come as immigrants. Until then, 
until they are Christian, they deteriorate our body politic and destroy our civilization. That scriptural phrase from Sargent, which I love, make them white in the blood of the lamb. It has a resonance that reflects the American ideology at this time, that conversion to Christianity made people more able to incorporate into a white Christian nation, or as one scholar notes, conversion to Christianity made a wide range of people appear to be more white. How far had we come from e pluribus unum as a resource drawing on our differences to the point where racial and religious differences were seen as a threat and legislation was passed to keep America as a white Christian nation? Two images from this time. So, so this is an image that is selling um, uh, a washing machine, right, where Uncle Sam is kicking out the Chinese worker, right? Um, and so the ways in which these ideas were circulated, they had theological reasoning, they had reasoning within the public sphere, they had reasoning within the media. Um, this one in particular, it's gonna be a little hard to see. Oh, it's not coming. You're gonna see three of them now because it's not. Oh, oh there we go. Okay, 1882, a political cartoon, the anti-Chinese wall. Built with the cement of congressional mortar, the bricks of jealousy, anti-low wage, non-reciprocity, law against race, competition, fear. The sense that in 1882 the U.S. was building a wall of a different kind. And the question right, of what are the bricks and the mortar of the wall, not just the literal wall, right, but the ideas that circulate that, that, circulate, that make a wall possible. And how are Christians continuing to be responsible for a allowing that discourse to circulate. Same era, the 19th century. The idea that to Christianize and convert people to white culture was what it would mean to be uh, American impacts also the indigenous peoples who remained on their ancestral lands. So this sense of converting and Christianizing from indigenous cultures to white culture was widespread and practiced. This is also the era of Jim Crow, where imposing a white moral code saw the lynching of innumerable black and Mexican people. But our religious leaders spread that ideology that people of all different uh, backgrounds, people of all different cultures, needed to be made into fully human beings in a white Christian mold. So this is from the Reverend Alexander Mackenzie, 1893, at the World's Parliament of Religions. These are all the leaders of the world's faith, and they are the representatives of the faiths to one another at this, uh, at this signature event, the World's Parliament of Religions. And Mackenzie is celebrating the project of America in these words, where white Christians are, quote, taking the black material of humanity and building it up into noble men and women, taking the red material Material, wild with every savage instinct and making it into respectable men. Instead of seeing God's people created in diversity, white Christians in this era saw their duty to uplift and civilize the diverse peoples of the nation into a culturally white and religiously Christian mold. But in addition to feeling the sting of the cultural erasure of religious and racial difference in our body politic, it's important once again to be reminded of the financial crime that this ideology underwrote. Selling Indian land for the benefit of white citizens transferred wealth again from indigenous people and into white property. The Asian workers who were exploited by the railroad company helped to build the nation with crucial infrastructure, but were then denied the benefits that citizenship would confer. In the era of Jim Crow, racial riots of white citizens against successful black businesses were too common an occurrence. All of these sins of the past were financial crimes, grounded in the ideology of racial and religious supremacy and legislated by white Christians. Each chapter of my history asks us to see the ideologies of white cultural superiority and Christian religious supremacy written into the laws that dispossessed people of color and people of other faiths from participating in the bounty of our nation.
The final chapter of my history sees, sees this wealth having been distributed to white Americans and white Christians actively struggling to keep this wealth in white hands. We've arrived at the era of the 20th century when legislation in the form of home ownership, education, and employment created structures that continued to keep a disproportionate number of people of color from participating fully in e pluribus unum. When in the 19th century, the United States expanded its boundaries into formerly Mexican lands, the annexation created an unbreakable economic tie between the peoples of the United States of America and the peoples of Latin America. In this era, to cultivate the land in the West, the United States set up a governmental program of labor known as the Bracero Program that invited millions of workers to support the agricultural production that would feed the nation. Yet while welcomed as workers, the public defense of their presence insisted that they would only be doing the, quote, undesirable work of stoop labor. The same people whose work was feeding our nation were not welcomed fully into e pluribus unum. The same pattern of invitation and exclusion was part of the Great Migration as workers from the South moved North to fill production roles during the war era. But through segregation and racial resistance were kept out of full participation. At the time of the Great Depression, the United States legislated further the exclusion of people of color. Two acts of legislation are the most significant. 1935, the Social Security Act. This act that follows the Great Depression and lays into place uh, social, um, sorry, safety nets, right, for future uh, problems that would have ar arisen similar to the Great Depression. This social safety net that was laid into place in 1935, you'll notice that the categories of workers that were excluded from the protections of Social Security were categories that employed countless workers of color, agriculture, domestic service, casual labor. When a white Christian nation approved this legislation, it was keeping the benefits, the blessings from people of color. Similarly, when the US set up the Federal Housing Administration and yet approved the use of racial coding for the distribution of mortgages in the practice that we've come to know as redlining, white Christians were upholding Sorry, white Christians were withholding the generational benefits of home ownership that would come out of this government pro sponsored program. And they did so, again, with scriptural reasoning. So this is an image from the era of integration, whether it's integration into the schools or integration into neighborhoods, it's the same era. And I was struck by this sign, cursed is the man who integrates. I don't remember seeing that in my Bible. Um, and I looked further, and it's Jeremiah 11, 3 through 6. Those of you who are biblical, biblically minded might know Jeremiah better than I do, so I went there, and I read Jeremiah, and I said, this doesn't seem to be about not integrating. And yet I've pulled out in the red, uh, I've, I've, I've placed in red what I think the reasoning was. Right? So Jeremiah says, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, cursed be anyone who does not heed the words of the covenant, which I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron smelter saying, listen to my voice, do all I command. You shall be my people. I will be your God that I may perform the oath that I swore to your ancestors to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as at this day. And I answered, so be it, Lord. That's the scriptural reference, right? This protection of our land flowing with milk and honey. Right, so, um, and I, it also just occurred to me that uh, in addition to redlining, um, uh, communities were allowed to establish what was called restrictive covenants. Right, again, this, this uh, religious language, right, and a restrictive covenant was a legal foundation for not selling to people of color within white communities. So how does the Christian narrative get used in this history in a way that dispossesses indigenous people, African Americans, Mexican Americans, the whole range of non-white peoples who would have been a, a strength in terms of diversity.
With these most recent episodes of legislation that denied the full benefits of citizenship to people of color, I want to underscore again that it was a financial crime legislated by white Christian America. For the exclusion from home ownership was not just the exclusion from a particular neighborhood, but exclusion from all the social benefits that a neighborhood would bring. Social connections, education, access to clean water, civic participation, and the exclusion from home ownership was an exclusion from the primary source of wealth building in this country, where economists recognize that owning a home is the single most important feature in a wealth portfolio and an inheritance that can be passed down to the next generation of one's family. What the sins of the past have bequeathed to us today is real, and it is a racial wealth gap. Sociologists and economists describe the racial wealth gap as the sedimentation of racial inequality. It's this image that I think is the most compelling. So this is from 2011, but there are more recent images that, that don't do it as quite as vividly, but they demonstrate that we continue to have a racial wealth gap in this country. That racial wealth gap was built through all of this legislation, which is why I keep underscoring these actions by white Christians as financial crimes. And they were done with the use of our scripture. Be fruitful and multiply, used against the original nations. Curse be Canaan, used against Africans. Make them white in the blood of the lamb, used against the Asians who would come and help build the country, and a land flowing with milk and honey to restrict access to these benefits for people of color, even as, late, as recent as our 20th century. In each period of U.S. history, it was Christian scripture and white Christians who mobilized to keep their inheritance, their inheritance, from people of color. There are two more directions from out of this history that I'd like for us to consider as we think our way forward. First, in every era, there was not only legislated dispossession and exclusion built on white Christian supremacy, in every era there was resistance as well. What might we, what might we learn by studying indigenous leaders who signed the Treaty of Delaware? or the American Indian movement of the 1970s, or closely following the original nations activists today? How might we find resources to resist the weight of white supremacy from those who resisted enslavement through revolution, escape, and legislation, through exposing white supremacy within white churches, all the way through to those who continue to demonstrate that black lives matter? What might we learn about the faith-based struggles for greater economic and racial justice from the Catholics who mobilized in the United Farm Workers Movement, or the Asian Americans of the 19th century who undertook the legal battles to ensure all peoples would be free to be citizens? The history of white supremacy in this country also demonstrates that the strength of resistance to white supremacy comes from a diversity of sources, comes from diversity itself. And we might study this history anew to find solidarity in our struggle today. But the other element I want to draw out of this history is the fundamental idea or the proposal that the Christian tradition is grounded in this teaching of loving one another. And I want to build on that the element of Catholic social teaching that might also be recognized as a resource to address where we are today. I think of Catholic social teaching as the attempt to live out love one another in the political, social, material world in which we live. One of the clearest statements of Catholic social teaching is found for me in the documents of Vatican II in Gaudium et Spes when the Catholic bishops from around the globe met in the 1960s to think about the church in the modern world, they seemed also to lean toward the principle of e pluribus unum in the recognition of the many different cultures and people who came together to form the global Catholic church. But in looking at this diversity, the bishops also insisted on key forms of unity that would provide the basis of our human community. We have many cultures and many different ways to form our societies, the bishops reasoned, but whatever else a society might provide for its members, these are fundamental. And this is what they said, 
whatever society we're in around the globe, there must be made available to all persons everything necessary for leading a life truly human, such as food, clothing, and shelter, the right to choose a state of life freely and to found a family, the right to education, to employment, to a good reputation, to respect, to appropriate information, to activity in accord with the upright norms of one's conscience, to protection of privacy, and to rightful freedom in matters religious. These should be the principles for all nations, and Christians in our nation should be guided by Catholic social teaching to ensure these foundational rights. But the existence of the racial wealth gap suggests that we continue in our failure to make Catholic social teaching a reality. One last piece of the history just two months before the bishops met at Vatican II, the United States was preparing to recreate our own society with a new set of immigration policies that would see America become one of the world's most multi-religious nations and continue to expand our national identity as multiracial. In signing this legislation in 1965, Attorney General Robert Kennedy remarked, and his quote here, as we are working to remove the vestiges of racism from our public life, we cannot maintain racism as the corner of our immigration laws. From 1965 to today, the last 50 years has seen an increase in the presence of peoples who would bring diversity as a strength to our shores. Women and men whose religious practices might be different from our own, but who might also be recognized as contributing to E Pluribus Unum. So from out of this history and thinking our way forward, we can see in this uh, slide the projection, both the, both the expansion and the projection, of our changing face in America from 1965 forward. Right? And the sense in which a nation that has identified itself as a white Christian nation is going to need to rethink and that e pluribus unum really might be something that we could reclaim. Right? And so thinking about how changes in, uh, in legislation, changes in terms of globalization, has changed the face of America, right? but how do we mobilize so that we're not repeating the chapters that we've seen in our early, earlier history. I think one of the things that I see in reviewing this history is the way in which our present moment seems to repeat so many things from each of those chapters. In navigating, in navigating our current chapter of the American story, the principles outlined by the U.S. bishops as the heart of Catholic social teaching might also be deep and faith-filled guides to navigating diversity. I'm just going to close with these principles as we ask ourselves the question, what would it look like for these principles of Catholic social teaching to guide our encounter with diversity, such that our faith and our citizenship might work together? What would it mean that Catholics would defend the dignity of each human person? What would it look like for Catholics to give priority to the poor and vulnerable? How would global solidarity be mobilized by American Catholics? How would we move our way forward with the promotion of peace? When we can see the weight of white supremacy in our legislation and our history, when we recognize the sedimentation of racial inequality, we might realize that it's not enough for Christians simply to be not racist as we seek and strive for the common good. It's just not enough to be not racist. One has to be, as Ibram Kendi has articulated, anti-racist. We need to find practices that actively and consistently aim to undo the racism that has been built into the fabric of our nation. It's my proposal in closing that, the, that Catholic social teaching is fundamentally anti-supremacist. It aims for all God's children to have an equal share in the blessings of our earth. Catholic social teaching is also fundamentally anti-racist. If only we will use these principles we have been given to directly address and undo the historic failure of Christians in this country. Thank you.
excellent. You're going to strive for the common good. So my work is done, and now your work begins. Um, are there questions? Uh, I have questions for you, but I'll, 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 uh, I don't know how much time you're planning, but maybe a few minutes of questions, and then I'm going to throw some more questions, some questions back to the energy in the group. Hi. Wait a minute. Janine, I have a question. Oh, sorry. I was wondering, as you went through the history, if you've given some thought and some study uh, to the um, migrations of other whites from Northern Europe and Eastern Europe and Russia and et cetera, that brought into a system that was already quite well developed here in this country. Because we often hear, and I hear from my own family who are Eastern European, that when they came in the middle of the, of the beginning of the 20th century, they were not responsible for slavery. And yet, we certainly benefited from the economic situation of slavery even to this day. So what was going on in European culture that there was a perfect fit between what they believed there and what we were practicing here? I was ready for an answer to a different to a different uh, ending question there. Um, I, I have focused most of my research on what was going on here. Um, and the answer that I'm going to give, and then you can tell me if, if you want a, a different answer. The answer that I'm going to give is the way in which um, so many white populations of immigrants came and they found themselves at the bottom of a racial hierarchy. Right. So even, I, I wish I had, had, had brought it, but the, I have a slide of the mortgage lending manual that was used from the foundation of the FHA, which is around 1934, and it was used all the way up into the 1950s. And, and basically, the economist Homer Hoyt says, well, this doesn't reflect on people's, uh, on, the, on the inherent value of the races, but it does reflect how the races are going to affect land value, right? That was the idea of the mortgage lending manual, was it was going to be dangerous, right, to um, offer a mortgage or insurance in a community right, that, was, uh, that was Mexican or that was African American. And so they have this racial hierarchy in the mortgage lending manual and Italians are down near the bottom. Actually, Southern Italians, is that right, are down near the bottom and Northern Italians are up a little bit further, right? Um, and so the sense in which at different eras of U.S. history, different groups came in and the Catholics the same thing. They weren't quite white Christians enough, right? They weren't, they weren't quite the right kind of Christian. And it took a generation or it took legis or it took a generation to finally make it. So the, the studies that talk about how the Irish became white, right? The Irish when they were first here, they're the ones I, I, from the study that I've done seem to have been uh, um, along with the crackers, right? A group of white designated that weren't quite white, right? So the Irish came in and they really weren't quite white. And their Catholicism was part of that, and their cultural background was part of that. But then they became white, right? And there's another scholar who talks about how the Jews became white, yeah. right? And so, so the study that I do have, right, kind of talks about how in each era of our history, we have a dynamic racial project, right? Who is categorized as white? Right? Who fits into that? Um, because the, the, the legislation has been that white affords certain benefits right, for those who are categorized that way. So it doesn't answer your question because I don't know what was going on in other places. Uh, the, the, the ideology of Christian supremacy, certainly it was a global phenomenon. Um, uh, and I don't know enough about the distinctive places. The, the phenomenon of white supremacy, it was a global phenomenon as well. Um, so they probably had an ideology of Christian supremacy and an ideology of white supremacy that allowed them to work their way up and say, oh, look, I really am white. And by the way, I'm, I'm Christian also, and that, that means something. Are there more questions? Yeah? What you've learned um, as being what you've learned 
um, as being part and parcel of the ed education process in the United States. Because what, what you propose and what you're showing us, I, I didn't think that that was, in fact, um, readily available to education of the children in the United yeah. States. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. It, it, it has to do with how we tell our national story, right? It has to do with what's in the education curriculum. Um, and, and I'll be honest, I just, ha I just uh, experienced um, that our education system also changes, right? So um, I, I remember uh, a group of students coming in and we're doing this kind of work and they said, oh yeah, my, oh yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, Chris, we had a critical perspective on Columbus. We, you know, we had a sense of the indigenous people, et cetera. And then this recent wave of students, they said, oh no, we celebrate Columbus. And it, and it seems to me that, that educators also go in generations and waves, right? And so the curriculum that might have been in place right after the civil rights movement, the curriculum that might have been in place in the 80s or the 90s, that that curriculum can, can change, right? And so it has to be an active and ongoing project of, of, of um, education. Um, I have, I have, uh, I'm, I'm holding back. Uh, so do we tell this history, right? I ask my students this every semester. I say, okay, you might know all of this. This might be the history that you already know because maybe the curriculum has changed, right? Um, and in some waves they have said, yes, okay, yeah, we, we tell this story differently. And in other waves they have said no. Um, but I also have children of my own. Uh, and the textbook, it, it won't, well, it seems like a minor thing, but the textbook that they use uh, to talk about the, the different ways that people in America live, the textbook for second grade uh, had the examples of uh, the, the rural, the, the urban, and the suburban. Right. Okay. So that, that's the, the that's the message of this of this um, lesson is that we have different ways of forming uh, different communities in our in our nation. But the example that this textbook used for the suburban was a a suburban community of Levittown, which had restrictive covenants that didn't allow people of color to move there. And the example that they're using for how people suddenly move to the suburbs was only a white history. It was only white people who could move to the suburbs. So, so in telling that story, there's a level of uh, education that is we need to make this explicit, right? We need to think in an anti-racist way about the history that we're telling and the history that we're studying, right? And we can do that. We can incorporate those elements into our histories. Um, but we also have to pay attention for white normativity, right, as the foundation for history that seems to be neutral. Um, and so I brought that to the second grade teachers and they said, oh, we're, we weren't really planning on discussing the restrictive covenants. So, well, we probably weren't. <laughs> When I hear, you know, going through the history, it really kind of like wipes you out. And so when, and in your closing, when you were talking about Catholic social teaching, um, I'd like you to expand a little bit more on that because I, I really got to say, I, I don't know what to do about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if that's already there, how do we do that? Yeah, that's a great, that's a terrific question. Um, so my, my theory at the moment is that legislation is important, right? Um, I, was, I, w I was thinking there might be some students from the college, and so my last slide is make sure we vote, right? Okay, that is an important component. Um, but the legislation that I uh, see as the structure of this dispossession throughout our history was also developed by a million different actions and actors. Right? The, the, the anti-racist organization, uh, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, talks about the function of gatekeeping. That is, there are places in which every single actor has the ability to make something happen or to not make something happen, right? Okay. So if we have, if we can see that the resistance to integration, right, was both legislation and it was angry white mobs, 
And it was people who said, well, that's just not my problem. And it was people who, you know, kind of said, well, I'm glad that's not my community that has to deal with that, right? So all of these million different um, decisions and actions that people made over this course of history, we have to ask ourselves, what are the little places and little decisions that we can make? And where are the sites of our gatekeeping? Okay, so that's one, one, the, the one question for myself as a, as a, as a white theologian, as a white professor, is what are the ways that I am unaware of participating in, in systems of white supremacy? How do I make myself aware of the systems of white supremacy that I participate in? And then how do I learn the strategies of disrupting them? Okay, so that's kind of on the ground. In the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century, churches were mobilizing, right? Um, Jim McGreevy's uh, study shows us that churches were mobilizing against integration, but churches were also mobilizing, right, uh, to, to bring people into a, uh, a more robust e pluribus unum with uh, civil rights legislation, right? Um, our church is still mobilizing. Our churches, our Christian churches, taking responsibility for our history, right? Our Christian churches thinking deeply about how our scripture was used, right? Um, and how is it that Christians might mobilize now? How might white Christians mobilize against the weight of white supremacy, right? And so thinking about, about, about that. Um, do Christians or do Catholics, right, think about striving for the common good, right, this principle from Catholic social teaching? Do they think about that in an actively anti-racist way, right? Do they, do they think about the movement of Black Lives Matter as a movement that's aiming for the common good? Right? Or do they think of that as someone else's movement? Right? Um, I want to see a few of the other, oh, there's my, giving priority to the poor and vulnerable, right? Do we have a lens on the racial wealth gap, right, that we see that giving priority to the poor and vulnerable, right, needs to include with it a sense of the racialization of wealth in this country, Right? And so thinking about how each of these principles, right, we need to read them through an anti-racist lens. We need to read them actively with the experience of communities and peoples of color in view. But the question was, what, what do each of us do? Right? What do we do? We, it's overwhelming. It's absolutely overwhelming. Right? But we've got, you, that was just centuries of millions of actors making the kinds of choices that made this history possible, right? And so we have to ask ourselves, what are the kinds of choices that I can make in my, and I'm not going to change this whole history, what are the kinds of choices that I can make in my day-to-day -day living and the kinds of places that I put my energies that, that might make a difference, right? Even if it's a small difference. Um, so, yes, it's overwhelming, but have we even stopped to mobilize ourselves around anti-racist principles, right? Have we stopped to ask questions about why my neighborhood is predominantly white? Have we stopped to ask questions about why my church is predominantly white? And why my pastor has never said that this is, this is unacceptable, right? Have we stopped to think about the generational inheritance of the institutions that were built with slave wealth, right, with slave labor? My institute, we, we think, oh, institutions in the North, oh, we didn't have anything to do with it. Hmm. Right? There are scholars who are helping us to see the economic ties between North and South in the, in the mid and late 19th century that the institutions in the North were often benefiting from uh, enslaved labor and a slave economy as well. Right, so um, that was all a lot of things at once. Um, I think we need to know our history. I think we need to know the, the, the underside of white Christian history. I think we need to challenge the history we've received. 
Right? Archbishop Hughes, we've got, we've got three statues at Fordham. One of them is Archbishop Hughes, right? Right? Does anyone say what was his, you know, what, what was he an anti racist Nobody says was he an anti-racist, right? Nobody asks those questions. Um, and so a being willing to ask the questions and then being willing to take responsibility. Um, being willing to say as a white theologian, if I could go back to that system, I benefit from this system. Right? When, my, when my grandfather bought a house, it was under that racist mortgage lending manual. Right? When I went to a good school, it was in a white neighborhood. The education I've received is because of, 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 the, of the unequal distribution of wealth that benefits white people in this country. Right? I have to take responsibility for that. Uh, and so it's a question of where will I lend my energies um, so that at least I'm doing something because I know I can't do everything. Very long answer. So my question to you is, what can we do? What can we do? Right, are there reasons? I mean, so it's an epic failure of Christians to love. That's how I. That's how what I think of it. Right? Can we do something different? Do you see possibilities and places for us to do something different? I can't. I know I'm being filmed and then I'm going to be on YouTube. I can't imagine my parish ever standing up and saying, we need to be anti-racist. I can't imagine it. I'm a, I'm a white Catholic theologian. I earned tenure at a prestigious institution. I would never be required to face the sin of white supremacy. I could write and publish and speak and never once talk about the sin that we're living in and breathing every day. That's a problem, right? We need to change our, our, our understanding. We need to change our narrative. White Christians need to take responsibility and we need to take responsibility for reparation as well. Uh, so that was supposed to be a question to you. <laughs> I mean, it, do you see signs of change? It's, we're, we're 50 years after the civil rights movement. The documents that were written in the 50s, Baldwin, King, Cohn, you read those texts today and you say, oh, they must be talking about 2018, 2019. No, they're talking about 1965, right? And so the question is, have you seen change? Do you see possibilities for change? The wisdom of the group. Well, kind of. <laughs> At this point in time, I don't see anything but a backward shift in the past four years with the current president. He knows how to get underneath and, bub and make what's bubbling, always bubbling underneath, burst out. He knows how to make people that are white supremacists angry. And that has put any gains in civil rights that this country has made, and they are kind of precious few, to, it, it, he's put us back 50 or 100 years. I love the phrase that you use that he somehow has mobilized people to get what's under the surface to bubble over. Right, but, but you've heard this before, that Catholic social teaching is the best kept secret or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get people to bubble over with this? How do we get Catholics to say, our faith, right, calls us toward the common good. Our faith calls us toward the poor and vulnerable. How do we, so I think you're right, right? I think that, that we've had a political landscape that has brought people's, um, uh, uh, has brought people out, but what are the rest of us doing, right? We all should be brought out and bubbling over and saying we won't stand for it. And yet, I, don't, I would like to know how many parishes are represented in this room where the discourse has bubbled over with absolute outrage at the, at the white supremacy in this country.
Right? How many of our congregations have bubbled over with that? Because that's what Catholics and Christians should be doing. If we see this counter movement, we see this movement in our public square, we should be saying, e pluribus unum, Christians are here too and we're going to love each other. And we've seen some of it, we haven't seen a whole lot from Catholics. Got a microphone coming. Just to state that in many Catholic parishes, our priests are not teaching us. They're not being taught. Um, I just had quite an argument because he says he cannot talk about this because his people do not want to hear it. Okay. And, and, and we have to think about that. Who are his people that don't want to hear it? Right? It's not an easy thing to hear, right? Every time I recount it and the question here, like, it's overwhelming. And people don't want to hear it, right? But to me, that misses out on the call of the gospel. I think the call of the gospel is amazing and unbelievable, the potential of who we could be as human beings, right? Um, I think we don't want to hear the call of the gospel. Yeah. Uh, I'm not politically active in the way I wished I were and had a lot of power, but I have lived in a multi-ethnic community most of my life. I have worked in a multi-ethnic community um, since I was 20 years old. And now, as a retired person living in a multi-ethnic community on a street that has every every type of person in neighborhood. Um, I can only do little things right now, like give the ma offer the mailman a glass of water when it was so hot yesterday. And the mailman happens to be a very tall, skinny black guy that I never saw before. And he seemed so surprised that I would do a kindness, and I, um, my, my, I wanted my children to grow up understanding that it, it didn't matter your color, your color of your hair, your eyes. It, that it, what mattered was how you behaved and how you treated each other. And uh, one of my sons, his be best friend, was a Haitian fella, and they they went on, you know, to. He was in the wedding party, and they're still very close. But I think we can do small things sometimes that have have power uh, when we can't do the bigger things that we wish we could do. <laughs> and, and I think that that is a, a piece of my point earlier, right? That that all of the possibilities for action are actions that we have to make commitments to. But I also want to, uh, I also want to bring in Brian Massingale uh, to this vision that, you that you've offered us of this multi-ethnic community. Um, because, because too many people's experience still is that racial segregation, right? Still is communities of color separated from white communities. Um, and Brian Massingale, uh, talks about the vision of heaven, the vision of the kingdom of God, right? When all peoples, right, will be part of the union of humanity in the presence of God. Right? And Brian Massengill says, well, we're, we're really not practicing too well for that, right? This sense that we have created too many locations, right, where we are surrounded by, where I, as a white theologian, am surrounded by other white theologians, right? We're at a predominantly white institution. My, my one African-American student, she can say, well, if I'm not here today, you do realize that there will be no people of color in this, in this class classroom and that the rest of you will think that's okay. Right? And so so the the sense in which um, we want to both celebrate those places where we can 
involve ourselves in interpersonal encounter, right? But there's too many places in this country where the interpersonal encounter can't even happen because the structures are not in place, right? The structures are not in place so that we truly have multi-ethnic, multi-religious communities, right? So, so I want to say yes, that's what we should be doing, um, but we also have to be looking at so many places in the nation where that just isn't possible, and we have to think structurally about those places that we might need to change. Over here, please. Thank you. Don't you think that part of the problem is because the church has so many problems of its own? I mean, when the, the man was saying that priests are fearful of bringing up certain things in, in speaking uh, or addressing the gospel, last week in North Carolina, for the first time, I saw a priest get a, not a standing ovation, but a somewhat standing ovation and clapping because he actually dealt with the concept of them, that we see others as them, and they are not us. And I think that I agree with you, we should all be doing more, but also the fact that we have these particular priests or Salesians who for most of their lives were teaching school but had to be brought into being pastors because there were not enough priests. So the church is still dealing with why are not uh, why are women not being made, okay, part and parcel when they do not have enough priests, okay? There are so many problems in the church itself. And don't get me wrong, because I, I love Pope Francis, but I think even Pope Francis is fearful of being um, outspoken about certain things within the church because of how um, the curia in, in the Vatican will deal with what he thinks. So we have problems within the church. We have problems within our politics today. Um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, the Supreme Court, um, you know, uh, I, the backlash. I think basically Trump was a backlash to having had a black president and people feeling that they had to control what maybe they were actually feeling, even though I think, I'm going to say, and I didn't agree with everything that President Obama did, but the reality was I think he controlled himself so that he wouldn't be seen as doing too much. And when he could have done more, possibly more for, for black people and people of color. So it just, sometimes I think it actually feels overwhelming. And that's why people feel, well, what can I do? Because they're overwhelmed with the necessity to do so much. So I, I want to I go back to your question about the church, because it, 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 it touches on uh, the, the concern earlier. Um, and from the world of organizing, I think what we need to do is a power analysis. Right? We need to ask questions about who has power, and why, who is giving them power, and why. And the, the, the principle of organizing is that there's a power to the people. I'm a, I'm a child of Vatican II. Right? I was I was given the the, the I don't know what it, what's the phrase right I was I was sold the bill of goods that this is the people of God that the church is the people of God right uh, and in a power analysis from the organizing world we would have to hear really clearly that statement of your priest that said my people don't want to hear it. Right? So, so I, I, I do think that the <laughs> I do know that the church has a lot of problems in its institutional face, right? And in the structures of power, right? But it's my white Catholic parish that allows my priest to say or not say, right? And so if, if there were 20 folks or 30 folks who knocked on the door and said, look, we really got to deal with this, right? Would your pastor be hearing, you know what? The people of God, I'm going to respond to that. But I'll, but I'll tell you, I don't think anybody in my parish is knocking on that door and saying we need an anti-racist gospel, right? Um, so, so I think you're absolutely right, right? That the church has a lot of problems, but... I'm going to throw in the Vatican II card and say, 
What am I doing about it? Right? If, if, my, if my parish priest is not going to do it, what are the rest of us doing? How do I organize and mobilize? Where am I going to put my energies? I can do. In reference, to, in reference to Vatican II, and in accordance to what he was saying also, the aspect of Vatican II, we have never been educated by, about that, unless you do it yourself and seek after what was in Vatican II. Do, are you, you're never exposed to it. If they had done that properly, maybe we would be in a different place. If we had taken it seriously. Um, I, I feel like we still teach a lot of Vatican II at Fordham um, in a good way, right? But if I had learned before my teaching with my colleagues and working with my, my, uh, social, my uh, service and justice office, right, if I had learned that the fundamental teaching of the Catholic Church at Vatican II was that everyone has a right to education, right? Everyone has a right to employment, a right to shelter, a right to food and clothing, right? If I, if I had heard that, right, then this sense that I get from my public discourse that, oh, well, those are private responsibilities, right? Because that's the, that's the narrative that we've received, right? Those are private responsibilities. Well, the, the bishops of Vatican II are saying those are not private responsibilities, right? And so I think that you're right, that there are, that there are principles within Catholic social teaching, right, that we simply haven't put into action. Um, and if education is a part of it, um, you know, then, then we ask ourselves the question, well, what are we, what, what is the education that's being handed down in, in, in Catholic uh, traditions? Um, and if it's not this, what is it? What's replacing the, the Catholic social teaching? I understand the goodness and the possibility of individual human actions. My question is, how do we move beyond that to dismantling the systems or at least approaching and announcing that the systems need to be looked at and um, changed. So that gives me an opportunity to, to um, be sharper in my response to earlier about gatekeeping. We're all a part of institutions. Right? So the first step is to know the history of our institution. The second step is to ask the ways in which my institution continues to perpetuate ideologies and practices of white supremacy. Right? So whether that's education, whether that's my church, whether that's my community, um, whether that's the place where I work, right? the systems are, are have their homes in our institutions, right? So I, as an educator, have to say, what kinds of practices of teaching, what kinds of practices of grading, what kinds of practices of admission, right, are continuing to perpetuate white ideology and white supremacy within my institution. And as gatekeepers, we have to ask that of each of the places that were found, right? What are the practices that we have that, per that, that, that perpetuate white normativity and that just go along with the system as it is? So, I mean, I would have to know a little bit more about where everybody is socially located to say, okay, well, what do you do to change a system, right? Um, how do you sit on the diversity task force in your department? I mean, that's the kind of questions that I ask in my own place, right? How do I learn about the history of educational practices that have had a white cultural frame? That, that's the work that I need to do. I'd have to know where are people situated, right? Where are the places where you see the system at work perpetuating Right? White well-being over the well-being of people of color, because that's what white supremacy is. Um, so so any, anyone want to brainstorm together? Like, what institutions are you part of that continue to perpetuate the, the outcomes? This is, this is Ibrahim Ken, Ibram Kendi's idea. He says, if you want to know if your institution is white supremacist, Right? Ask whether its outcomes appear to, uh, appear to benefit white people over people of color.
right? Does your institution primarily serve white people and their interests? Um, and so we would need to have a little bit more on the table in terms of saying, well, are there business practices that you're part of, right? Are there, are there uh, decision making within your institution that seems to perpetuate, right, um, the well-being of, 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 of white people um, rather than systems in place that are anti-racist um, that attempt to use the resources of your institution um, for the well-being of people of color as well? Does that even start an answer for you? Yeah, okay. There's a question in the front, but I don't have a... There's a microphone coming behind you here. Thank you. To all of these uh, comments from people, I'm thinking that the basis of all the non-movement has to do with fear. I don't know what I'm going into. I'm feeling it. And I know 30 years ago I got into prison ministry and I see great, great injustice there where people are sentenced if they're white, they don't get any heavy sentence. If they're black, they get a much more heavy sentence. And uh, people are afraid to go in prison. I was too until my country cousin invited me to go on like I thought she was in a picnic the way she was all excited going into prison and it turned out to be one of the worst prisons in my life. And I saw several offers and I was up down the hill overlooking the river. And I wanted to uh, dig in and not go but it was my pride that kept me going. Uh, how could she uh, do that? And here I am in love for so many years, and I didn't want to do it, and I was afraid. And that was the best thing I ever came at. And I have 13 programs in Missouri State, State Prison, and uh, there are a lot of them around town in other states. And people are set loose, they see it in their eyes. The great injustice is done to the black police. Can I can I ask us to hear that uh, insight and to ask ourselves the question: What are we afraid of? Right? Um, what are we afraid of? One of the one of the stories that that white people tell, uh, and that I hear in my own family. Uh, is we're going into a, a bad neighborhood, right? We, you need to lock your doors, right? And I realize that that has an affective impact on me, right? And so when I'm walking in a community of color, I think, and then it occurred to me, I'm like, I'm afraid of poor people? I'm afraid of people of color? What am, what am I afraid of? Right? And, and why didn't my theological right, life in a Catholic church shape me to be unafraid of other human beings that God has created? Where, where does the fear come from? Right? And so I, I, want, I, I, I appreciate that insight, right? That, that we don't, you know, or, or I don't want to be the one to raise again the fact that we're hiring another white theologian. I'm afraid that my colleagues, right, will think I'm a broken record, right? I'm afraid that if I do this, I'm going to do it wrong. Right? There's all kinds of reasons why white people are afraid to do anti-racism work. And there's all kinds of reasons why we should be afraid of doing anti-racism work. Right? That too often anti-racism work does what white people have always done, which is serve white interests. Right? And so I have to think carefully Right, about the reasons that I might be afraid, the good reasons that I might be afraid, and how do I look for um, solidarity and support in doing this work? Right? And so I think that that's a really amazing question for us. Why hasn't this work already been done? What might we be afraid of in doing this work? And how does the call of the gospel 
Isn't there something about be not afraid? And so this sense that the gospel itself has, has resources for us to navigate this particular moment of our history um, that is untapped, uh, as far as I can see, right? That we really need to mobilize uh, and to, to not be fearful um, because this chapter is going to become another chapter. And it's either going to be a chapter where uh, uh, the dominant political discourse now wins, or it's going to be a chapter where we see traces of resistance. And I think we're at time. Do you have something to say in closing? Thank you, Janine. You can see why we were so excited when uh, Dr. Hill Fletcher agreed to be our speaker tonight. Uh, and and the, I was thinking that Pakistan video, uh, they were asked, you know, the big attitudes, and, and you notice two of them said, blessed be the peacemakers. And uh, Janine, blessed are you, <laughs> because you're carving out and creating markers and for pathways of peace and understanding in the midst of the world that is in such need of understanding and new pathways. A world that needs all of us to truly love one another. So, so we thank you for the challenge that you put before us tonight. Uh, we have a lot to think about and a lot to reflect on and we're very, very grateful. Thank you. Uh, please mark your calendar for Thursday, April 2nd. That is our next lecture. And we will be welcoming Cardinal Timothy Dolan to Dominican Convent for the next J, Dr. J.T. Liu lecture. And Cardinal Dolan will be speaking on the really one of the most urgent calls we have now as Christians, to the need to respond to the care of creation. So the Laudato Si and what the call of Christians to really care for creation. So that will be uh, April 2nd, and if you've given your information to us, you'll get a notice about that. Uh, and if you want to receive those email reminders, please you know, make sure that you uh, fill out one of the forms at the back of the room. Uh, there's information about the Dominican Sisters if you don't know too much about us. So hopefully tonight you got a sense of what we care about. So uh, there's a basket in the back, any free will donations, and there's nice refreshments over there. So please uh, continue the conversation. We, you're welcome to stay as long as you'd like to stay and have a conversation. So thank you for coming.